listening, everyone. Father, we just thank you for this time of being able to go before you. We just all ascend higher into the third heavens as we go forth with this message. We pray that our spirit beings would be open and that you would give us even more revelation knowledge as to what you're doing in this time period and in this season. We express our love to you from the very depths of our hearts. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Tonight we're going to be talking some more about political trends from the 28th century. Praise the Lord. Tonight we're going to be talking about political trends for the 2018 midterm elections. And we're going to be doing this in light of things that will be occurring um, over the next two years, possibly six years. Dear, please let this be settled within your heart and within your spirit. President Donald Trump will do two terms. Don't let anyone persuade you of anything different. Um, don't be uh, fooled by anything that's going on. Some of the things that um, I pulled out of here and the things that you're going to see, they don't necessarily have to happen, but it's a possibility. And we wanted to bring this to your attention, number one, so that you could be praying, and number two, so that you don't be caught off guard by the things that are going on. Um, God has always called us to be well-rounded in every area, and he's always call, called us to not walk with our head in the sand in regards to different things that are going on. Um, for example, if you look at the things that are going on with the fires in California, that is an extreme amount of devastation that has happened in two different places. But we have to keep our wits about us. If that were to happen here in Delaware, we as a church shouldn't be falling apart we shouldn't be running around like there is no god and we should be in total and complete control and because god has given us foreknowledge that these events were going to happen um i remember a long time ago god prophesied through pastor barber and he said that every state was going to have some form of devastation hit it um and that's that has happened that has happened and is still going on and still happening. So when it hits Delaware, we are going to be strong. We are going to be doing the things that God has asked us to do. And we're going to bring in the harvest all at the same time. So do not get upset about the things that are going to be talked about tonight. Take them into your spirit. Um, First Chronicles 12, 32. Of the tribe of Issachar, men who understood the times, with knowledge of what Israel should do, 200 chiefs and all their relatives were at their command. It's much better to know the truth, and it's much better to know what's going on. And it's because God has called us as a prophetic people, he is revealing these different things to us. So, so let's take it as a positive. Another scripture, Luke 21, verse 32 to 36. But surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So because we have foreknowledge, because God has warned us, it's not supposed to take us off guard. Verse 36. <clears throat> Watch therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Now we're going to watch a PowerPoint video that talks about some historical trends that are being seen. 
And as you all know, um, if you look at some types and shadows of different things that have happened in the Bible, history repeats itself, these events go on, and we can learn from those things. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to happen that way, but if you see something that looks like it, it's happened before, you can take those clues and kind of get a foreshadowing of what's going to be happening. Now these things may happen just as this guy says, or they may not happen. We talked about some of this last Wednesday when we did our post-election evaluation. It was clear that the country is trending toward growth in the Democratic Party. Now this trend is happening behind the scenes. And I'm saying it's happening behind the scenes because if you look at all of the information that's coming out politically, it looks like everyone is pro-President Trump, which is good, but they're not showing you what, they're, what the, the bad people are doing. It's kind of being hidden from us. And I believe it, this can work against us in this way. It will cause us to get into a false sense of security, a false sense of thinking everything's okay, so we can kind of rest back now. You know, God is, God is taking this and he's doing the things that he's told us he was going to do. And history has proven that when this occurs, the church takes a step back. The good people take a step back, and the evil people go forward. So we want to, as we're looking at this information tonight, keep that in the back of your mind, and, and let's get a mindset of not stepping back, but continuing to press forward in God's agenda. In the PowerPoint, you're going to hear some constant references to red state and blue state. I just want to define that for you so you know what that is. Since 2000, the United States presidential election, red states and blue states have referred to the states of the United States whose voters predominantly choose either the Republican Party, red, or the Democratic Party, blue. Those are, the, those, are those two terms, and that's what they mean. So if you hear someone say red state, they are pro Republican. If you hear someone say blue state, they are pro Democrat. Okay, so let's get started with the video. <coughs> What's about to happen in America, which as I'll show you is spelled out not only by history but by basic math as well, will have profound consequences for you, your family, and your finances. Right now, as you read this, a revolution is underway in this country. But it's not the kind of revolution most people expect. There won't be any military parades, no abrupt seizures of power, or thankfully election-related violence of any kind. Nevertheless, this new era coming to America will impact just about every area of your life, from the taxes you pay, to when you can retire, all the way down to details like where you vacation, or send your kids to school. It will have huge implications for our retirement system. Social Security, and Medicare. We'll witness major changes to the fabric of society. I predict we'll even see a new system of minimum incomes that will cause income taxes to quadruple just to partially pay for them. Very little stands between you and a new political regime most Americans can't even fathom today. My guess is, as you hear what President Trump's enemies are preparing to do to him, you'll think to yourself there's no way they can carry out this plan. Not here, not in America, that even for them, this is a bridge too far. But when I lay out the facts for you here in this presentation, I think you'll see that this new tide of change isn't just possible, it's a mathematical certainty. And it starts with a story that's already causing political earthquakes in America, a phenomenon that you'll never see reported in the 6 o'clock news. Something is happening in America. All over the country, over the last two years, Republicans have been losing elections they shouldn't be able to lose, and being replaced by Democrats who shouldn't have been able to win. You've probably heard of the most famous examples. Elections like Alabama's Senate race last December, where voters sent a Democrat to the Senate despite Trump's pleas, even though Alabama gave Trump 62% of the vote in 2016. Or last spring's congressional election in Pennsylvania, where voters replaced a Republican congressman with a Democrat, even though Trump won the district by 20 points and campaigned heavily for the GOP's nominee. 
But there are dozens more mysterious political upsets that have already happened. Cases of Republicans losing in political terrain that Trump won even more overwhelmingly than Pennsylvania or Alabama in state and congressional level races across the country. In Kentucky last February, a Democrat state lawmaker replaced a Republican, even though Trump won the district with a 72% of the vote. In rural Wisconsin, a Democrat unseated a Republican state lawmaker despite Trump's 17-point margin there two years ago. And in Iowa, a Democrat took a state Senate seat from a Republican even though GOP voters outnumbered Democrats in the district by approximately 2 to 1. In Oklahoma, a Democrat took a staunchly red House seat with 60% of the vote. And in Virginia last year, Democrats pulled off an incredible coup when they defeated 16 Republican lawmakers for re-election. Once again, they even prevailed in districts Trump won. And these are just a few examples. Since Donald Trump took office, 45 Republican lawmakers have been fired by voters including dozens more in ruby red places like Georgia and Oklahoma that Trump won overwhelmingly. These are election results that shouldn't be possible in normal times, but as you'll see, what's happening in America today is anything but normal. As Republican after Republican goes down in the months and weeks before national voting even begins this November, even some mainstream media outlets are catching on. The defeats have been so shocking, it's been impossible for even them to ignore it. They're even catching on to the fact that the blue wave is gaining strength, though they have no idea what it will mean for most Americans down the road. But we do. Simply put, the blue wave is a national political environment where liberals in their tens of millions are so fired up to vote, so determined to donate and canvass and organize for leftist campaigns that their energy and sheer numbers means no Republican office holder is really safe. Even the Republican majority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, is being blunt about the danger for his party as he publicly admits that a Category 3, 4 or 5 storm is coming for Republicans in November. The blue wave is even strong enough to wash out Republicans running in staunchly conservative districts, as we've already seen in Alabama, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, Iowa and Georgia, to name a few examples. You can see its effects in more than these dozens of shock election upsets, however. As I'm sure you've noticed, America's politics in recent years has hit an inflection point. A changing of the political tide, if you will. Now, you can't think about this in terms of Democrat and Republican. You have to start looking at this in terms of morality versus immorality. Traditionally, the Republicans have been pro-Christian, pro-God, pro-serving um, the country, serving humanity, and the Democrats have been against God, pro-abortion, um, doing things that will destroy the family, doing things that will destroy the, the moral fabric, fabric of the people. So what he's not saying here is... <clears throat> These, these, even though these districts are heavily Republican and the people that are in these areas are heavily Republican, the morality level in these areas is de decreasing. God is decreasing in these areas. So while <clears throat> we have all of these positive things that are being done by President Trump and people who believe like him, there's also the devil who's on the rise in these areas. Because as these areas become taken over by sin, um, if you look at the different states that are legalizing the use of marijuana, they're legalizing the use of gambling. You know, the sex trade is increasing in these states. That is an increase in sin. That is a decrease in the morality in the people who, who believe in, against those things are not having their voice heard and they're not they're not going out and getting involved politically because there's a great sense of we're okay now. The, the economy's doing better. Um, they have caused the tax decreases because they did the tax decreases in 2017. And there's an overall sense of comfort that shouldn't be there, an overall sense of complacency. And while that complacency is there, the devil's doing his work in different people, in different events. Now, 
even though a lot of positive things are happening and being done by President Donald Trump, the hearts of this people of this country have changed. They have changed to the point where places President Trump won have the appearance that people in these same areas no longer support him. We also have a great influx of Islamic, the Islam, Islamic faith in this country. They're coming in by huge numbers. So you have this battle between light and darkness. The, the Islamic people do not believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. So you have all of this going on behind the scenes, and these people are getting involved politically. So what are they doing? They're encouraging other people who believe like them to get out and get, get involved and participate in this. So these heavy numbers where President Trump won by large majorities, that's being overturned because now the people who are for darkness are going, getting into those places, into those positions, and because they're in the government, they have governmental authority to change things in the spirit realm, and you're, we're seeing our country go down. Now, the other thing that, that goes along with this is because these people are in the government, that authority is going out across the land. It's causing more and more darkness to be let into the United States. It's a reflection of the hearts of the people, but it's also a reflection of the hearts of the leaders that we have here in this country. Now what happened is the people who voted for President Trump became secure, are becoming secure in the fact that he is in office for four years. So they're stopping to participate. They're backing off in the election processes, even on the local level. Let's look at what happened just in Delaware last week. We talked about this before. The Republicans lost two seats in the, in the House because the Democrats were more active and more involved in those races. So this has the appearance of looking like the people of Delaware don't want President Trump's policies to affect Delaware, but this isn't true. What's really happening is that people are complacent. They assume that because the president can't be stopped, there is no need to carry on the fight for good. So, so the little guy, the good guy, stops participating and a big change takes place in the political realm because everything feels like it's okay, and it's not. Let's continue on with the PowerPoint. You can see it both in recent statistics and current events. In 2016, a self-described socialist, Bernie Sanders, nearly captured the Democrat nomination, and the Democrat Socialists of America Party's membership has surged since then. All told, since November 2016, their membership has grown by 700%. They've added as many as thousands of new members in just a few weeks, and that's not including the one-day spike of 1,152 new card-carrying Socialist Party members following Democrat Socialist Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's congressional win last June. You can see the rise of the far left reflected on the ground in America too. Take the more than 750 protests that erupted across the country last summer, for example, with hundreds of thousands of protesters taken to the streets against Trump's immigration policies. Or look at the Women's March earlier this year, which brought millions of people to the streets again, 300,000 in Chicago and half a million in Los Angeles alone. Meanwhile, the rise of other left-wing groups like Black Lives Matter has forced politicians to apologize for mere allegations or even resign. In fact, the Me Too movement has even toppled a sitting U.S. Senator. Now, all of these numbers may seem like far-off statistics or just usual flare-ups in liberal hotspots if it weren't for one major warning sign. One fact I haven't seen any mainstream media outlet even acknowledge. In short, the passion that we're seeing on the left, the white-hot registration drives, the massive rallies, and the increasing radicalization are doing more than fueling it a historic blue wave this November. You see, the term blue wave is something of a misnomer. A wave, after all, is something that dissipates and loses strength eventually, like when a wave crashes into a beach. It becomes a spent force. It's much bigger than just one or two election cycles. It will usher in a new era in American politics that could last a generation or more. And you don't have to take my word for it. 
The proof, as I'll show you, is already here. Have you seen this map? It was put together based on data from CNN's 2016 exit polls, and it shows how the election would have gone if only people aged 18 to 40 had voted. As you can see, for Donald Trump's party, it's not a pretty picture. Of the states he won in 2016, he loses Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Ohio, Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Voters under 40 would have overwhelmingly handed Hillary Clinton the election, and these liberal voters are getting major reinforcements, with an estimated 10,000 new millennial voters turning 18 every day this year alone. Keep in mind, in 2016, Trump won the three traditionally Democrat states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, by a combined 77,744 votes. In other words, the election could have been swung the other way by fewer people than it takes to fill an Ann Arbor's Michigan stadium. Remember, Hillary Clinton actually won the popular vote by millions of votes, despite being seen as untrustworthy by most Americans. That means, to win in the Electoral College, Trump basically had to thread the needle. With his razor-thin victories in those three swing states, he drew the political equivalent of an inside straight. But with more than 10,000 Americans turning 18 every day, that means that Trump's Electoral College win can be wiped out in just one week of the demographic change America's undergoing. Pundits can argue hypotheticals all day, but in the end, the math is the math. We both know that these millions of millennials won't just be satisfied with taking their anger out on Republicans in this year's midterm elections alone. They will be back in 2020 and each election after that. They will be just as angry, just as radical. The only difference will be that each year there will be millions more of them and the consequences for our politics will be transformative. Already, women are running for Congress and winning major party nominations in record numbers this election. In Vermont, Democrats just nominated the first ever transgender candidate for governor in America's history. And in Minnesota, a Somali-American woman is poised to become the first female Muslim in Congress. Already, 2020 is expected to be the first election ever where millennial voters outnumber baby boomers, Trump's most loyal age group. That is it. The blue wave is here. As one retiring Republican senator, Jeff Flake, warns, at a certain point, the flood becomes the thing most worthy of attention. It might be time to build an ark. Or as Pat Buchanan, former senior advisor to Presidents Nixon, Ford and Reagan, and one-time GOP presidential candidate puts it, the Republican Party is facing a demographic death sentence. On the Democrat side, Dan Pfeiffer, former White House counselor for Obama, notes this could be a generational opportunity for the Democrats to lock in several very key segments of voters for a long time to come. So, when you see poll after poll showing a majority of millennials now reject capitalism, when Quinnipiac polling shows that just 19% of Americans aged 18 to 29 approve of Trump's presidency, when political scientists like David Anderson of the Iowa State University warn that the millennial vote really could create one-party rule in this country for the first time in 50 years, and when polls show that 65% of millennials want Democrats to control Congress, it's time to start asking, what will the blue wave mean for me, my family, my finances? But you don't really have to wonder. The new political era we're entering already has a roadmap ready to be followed to a T by this generation's ascending leftists. How do I know? Because it's happened here in America before. There was um, insider information and, and President Trump has um, acknowledged this. Him and his team, because of the polling information from the 2016 election, they did not believe that they were going to win. They were preparing to give concession speeches. So when they found out they did win, they were in complete shock. Now imagine this also. Hillary Clinton, she, is, she was told, you're going to win. She didn't do as much campaigning as President Trump did. She was 
she was pretty much um, behind the scenes and out of the way because someone told her, hey, this is yours. Just sit back and ride the, the wave, so to speak, and you can have it, hand it. She was so mad, you know, and this is this has all been documented and true, that she literally just became intoxicated that night and they could not get her to come out to make her speech saying the, you know, she lost. And they, it was, it was ridiculous the amount of anger that she had. I'm saying all of this to say those same people who backed her and supported her are still working behind the scenes now and they have not stopped. All of the anger that you saw from the millennials as he talked about, they're still carrying that torch for her and they're still carrying it in this country and they have dedicated themselves to work behind the scenes to overthrow anything that is for morality. Um, again, this is why the numbers are, are switching so quickly. He cited a, a reference in there, the 18 to 29 year olds right now. Each year now until the, the 2020 election, they are gonna grow in number and because they have become radicalized by um, the socialism, Bernie Sanders is another, another name that he mentioned in there. They stole his win from him out of that election. He was supposed to win, but they had some type of dirt on him, on his wife, and they convinced him to get out of the election. But he is still actively working now behind the scenes with these 18 to 29 year olds, pulling them, trying to start another election bid for 2020. <clears throat> Putting all of this information together, there is a big underground movement that is working, that we have to be aware of. Now, what this guy is trying to get you to see is that because of the shift in age of the population and political views of the millennials, um, currently 22 to 37, they are radicalized and they are anti-capitalism. Um, our country was built on the capitalist system. You work, what you earn, you keep. The socialist system is you work for the government and the government divvies out what everyone has. This is why everyone was so excited about Obama because Obama said, okay, you want a cell phone? The government will give you a cell phone. You want to go to school? The government will make a way for you to go to school. You want a home? The government will make a way for you to give a home. This is why there was so much love for him. But see, this is, this is a change in the mentality and the ideology of us as, as uh, citizens of the United States. Because instead of capitalism being taught in the school districts, socialism is being taught. And our, our children now are knowing and believing that it's, it's, it's a sin or it's bad to be rich. It's a sin or it's bad to have enough money to take care of your family. And they're being taught that you should be dependent upon the government for everything in your life. This is this age group that's coming up now, and they're okay with that. Another um, demographic that he cited in there was the baby boomers. The baby boomers was a generation that grew up after the Depression. They had it hard, and they saw what their parents went through, and they worked, and they worked, and they worked. And they, do, they were taught, don't depend upon the government for anything. So as that age group is getting older and dying out, we have a new age group that is coming on the scene that believes that the government is supposed to take care of them. All of these things are coming into play. Um, they believe in socialism. They believe the government should take care of every one of their needs. He mentioned Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's in a fight right now to hold, uh, to take the seat from Senate Majority Leader. Sorry, I got this wrong. She's in a fight to take the seat from the Senate Minority Leader, Nancy Pelosi. Remember last week when we were talking about her numbers and she won her district by 85%? They weren't voting for her. They went in the, into the booth and they voted straight Democrat because there's a plan that's out there that they're going to try to take her power from her. 
because they want this more radicalized section of the Democratic Party to come to the forefront. And, the, you know, she was happy and she was gloating, but now she's in, in trouble because they, this Cortez lady has definitely said, hey, why don't you let somebody younger in there who, who doesn't have all of this um, experience and knowledge that you do and who's not stuck politically inside of this system and we can get things done. And she's, she's gotten a lot of traction. Um, the first transgender person was defeated. But think about this. Because it was a Democrat, it got 110,206 votes out of 151,000 that were Republican. So because they believed in, in the Democrat side, they didn't care about it trying to decide whether it was a male or a female, we're just going to vote for it. And eventually it will be sorted out. There's other races that have this same situation going on around the country, different smaller offices, and people are saying no. Um, Delaware had two openly homosexual candidates running for their uh, uh, con congressional spots. They still got votes where before this would not have gotten a vote. They, they would have, they would have been laughed off the scene. They don't you even think about running? But you see how much the, the mindset has changed, morality has gone from the people. They don't even care. As long as it's a Democrat, we're, we're gonna vote for them. This is how sick this, this, this nation has gotten, the people in this nation have gotten. <laughs> The line has become blurred of what is right and wrong. And the more the older generation and Christians fail to participate, the more that we're giving them control. We can continue on with the next phase of the PowerPoint. Take a look at this man. Does his face ring a bell for you? To the vast majority of Americans, it doesn't though I'd be willing to bet most would recognize each and every one of his successors. He's Herbert Hoover, America's 31st president. In 1928, he came into office with a solid reputation as a savvy businessman. He had won a decisive victory in the Electoral College, despite never having held elected office before. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? In fact, like Trump, Hoover came to power by defeating his out-of-touch New Yorker opponent. Like Trump, he took office during a time of relative prosperity. And once in office, he also carried out protectionist trade policies, took a divisive stand against illegal immigration, and mounted a tireless campaign to protect American jobs. He even slashed immigration to America by 90% while cracking down on the illegal immigration through deportations that targeted as many as 1.8 million people. These populist actions won him his share of enemies, but also the love of his diehard supporters and a wave of initial popularity in America. But here's the thing. In the year after Hoover's victory in 1928, no one would have ever dreamed that it would be another 24 years until a Republican won the White House again. That for tens of millions of Americans, Herbert Hoover would be the last Republican president. You see, behind the scenes, a new kind of political opposition was building, and America's voting electorate was transforming in ways not just Herbert Hoover, but his whole GOP were completely unprepared for, a force even bigger and more permanent than the economic disaster he'd soon be facing. A massive blue wave. Just like today, in the 1930 midterm elections, Republicans suffered devastating midterm losses, losing 52 seats to Democrats. It was a sign of things to come. In 1932, Democrat Franklin Roosevelt ran and won the presidency in a landslide on a campaign that promised a massive expansion of the welfare state. You may be thinking his defeat of Hoover was thanks to the Great Depression, and that certainly played a role. But a simple secret would enable FDR and his party to win election after election for years to come. You see, FDR was a president unlike any America had ever seen before. He proclaimed it was his duty to take an activist role in managing America's economy and natural resources. 
He promised to get to work distributing wealth and products more equitably of adapting existing economic organizations to the service of the people. Once in power, his administration got right to work, spreading the wealth around, as promised. In his first hundred days of his presidency, Roosevelt pushed through 15 major laws as a part of his New Deal program to massively expand government's role in America's economy. His Agricultural Adjustment Act, for example, actually paid farmers to produce fewer crops in order to bolster the incomes of his rural voters, even as thousands of poverty-stricken Americans faced starvation. Meanwhile, FDR's Tennessee Valley Authority program displaced thousands of Americans to make way for his power plant and dam projects. In 1935, he created Social Security, laying the groundwork for America's modern welfare state. This was the only change he considered more important than his creation of America's minimum wage. In those first few years in office, no welfare program was too expensive for FDR to pursue. He ignored his campaign promise to balance the budget and ballooned the deficit to a then unheard of $6.2 billion. And as he poured billions of dollars into handouts to reward his supporters, he also punished his enemies with taxes and regulations. His 1935 wealth tax, for example, hiked taxes on America's wealthier citizens to as much as 75% of their incomes. Today, most people think that FDR got re-elected to an unprecedented third and fourth terms because his policies helped fight the Great Depression. But that's simply not the case. Inflation levels reached as high as 10% a year in FDR's America, and unemployment averaged 18% during his first eight years in power. But to the masses clamoring for his handouts, it didn't matter. Four years later, they awarded him an epic mandate with his decisive re-election, even though unemployment was 60% higher than it had been when he'd taken power four years earlier. FDR won re-election with the largest popular vote majority of any presidential candidate ever up until that time. How did FDR win presidential elections again and again, despite presiding over such misery? It's a law of power as old as civilization itself. Reward your supporters, punish your enemies. In his famous Madison Square Garden speech, he called his political opponents enemies of peace, as well as bankers and war profiteers, and said of them, I welcome their hatred. Understand, if American people wanted true economic progress and recovery, they never would have given FDR such a triumphant re-election after the inflation and unemployment surges of his first four years. But the masses wanted something simpler, handouts. After his re-election victory, the U.S. entered recession again in 1937, with unemployment spiking to 20%. But again, that hardly mattered. Ultimately, the stretch of one-party rule in America under Democrats would last 24 years. It took a nationally celebrated war hero in Dwight Eisenhower to finally return the White House to Republicans in 1952. But by then, America was unrecognizable from what it had once been. Pretty shocking, isn't it? When you, when you really look at the, the bigger picture of everything that is going on, and we have a tendency to only focus in on our area, you know, our families, our region, but you really need to take a step back and look at the country as a whole and look at the trends as to what's going on. Now, they're saying that um, Hoover parallels President Trump because of the fact now, Hoover was not FDR. Hoover did a lot of things to strengthen the economy, protect us, protect the borders, um, and strengthen our trade across the, United, across the world. One of the very first things that President Trump did was, was tell NATO and the foreign nations, hey, it's time that you guys start paying your fair share to, back to the United States. And... They hated him for that, but he's right. You know, we've been footing the bill for all of these countries over there in Europe for, for a long period of time, and it's, it's not fair. You know, they signed agreements and they signed treaties after World War II that they were going to pay to rebuild Europe. They, they have reneged on those deals, and they have not paid what they were supposed to pay. The other thing that's going on is everyone's um, coming against President Trump because 
they're saying he's playing hardball with China. Well, why is it fair that we have to pay taxes to ship stuff over there to sell to them? We have to pay them taxes to sell our stuff. But they can send stuff over here and there's no taxes on it. That doesn't make any sense. So what the things that he is doing is trying is, is, is turning things around and there he's negotiating, but he's getting us better deals. So again, there's this sense of complacency that we're in a better place. He's opening up oil, oil drilling um, for the Alaskan pipeline which is going to drive our gas prices down. Who's very upset with him because of that? The wild, radical environmentalists. You can't destroy the spotted owls, and you can't destroy the, the pristine desert land by putting a pipeline through those desert lands. Well, it's either drill those oil, oil wells or be subject to paying four dollars a gallon gas to Saudi Arabia at their will when we have plenty of gas here in our country that we can use and not be robbed by a foreign power and a foreign entity. Obama was okay with us paying four dollars a gallon for gas. He said it let it go as high as ten dollars a gallon. It didn't bother him at all. And, and the thing that we forget about these politicians is once they get in office they're not paying for gas anymore. The government's taking them around. We're paying for that gas. So they don't care if it goes up. They don't even feel it. They don't feel it like we do. So the, the mindset of us getting, giving a, uh, getting a handout, oh, I, get, I got a cell phone from the government, big whoop. But there's so many people who don't understand you know, these basic things, and it's not being taught in school. Parents are not teaching it to their children, so they're completely unaware of how we're being enslaved by one group of people over the other. And they're happy to keep us enslaved because we don't know any better and we're not doing anything. Welfare. You heard him talk about the Social Security in this segment. Social Security should have been fixed and corrected at least 40 years ago. But because it was deemed that you were being racist to even try to touch it and fix it, they left it alone. Now the Congress itself over the years have taken money out of the social security system and paid for other little pet projects that they needed. This should have never been, but they did it. They took all of the money out of it. And there's no money there. Eventually by the time, you know, I retire or whatever, they're, they're definitely predicting it's not the money's not there. But we shouldn't be dependent upon the government to take care of us. And, and this, is, this is what's hold all the way backwards with this welfare system. So because President Trump is similar to Hoover, they're saying that this system is setting itself up to try to destroy him. So who, whoever the next person is, Bernie Sanders, he keeps promising you know, to, to, to take care of these people, they're, they're hungry for this. They're wanting this to take place. So we have to be aware of this as it's going on. Let's continue with the rest of the PowerPoint. In those 24 years, the national debt soared 956% from $23 billion to $243 billion, while the dollar lost more than half its value, including a 75% devaluation practically overnight with the 1934 Gold Reserve Act. Amid all the stagnation, heightening taxes, and persistent poverty, the British magazine The Economist wrote in 1938 that, for the moment, the United States seems to have forgotten how to grow. That's because, while FDR's handouts bought voters' loyalties by the millions, they couldn't buy anything else. Not prosperity, not lasting peace, and certainly not any kind of security for America's working class. A full decade after FDR's election, the economy was still in tatters. What would eventually jumpstart America's economy again was a monumental war that forced every facet of American industry to meet the production demands of a war economy. 
And even after the prolonged Great Depression finally ended, the system of government overreach FDR put in place remained, cemented by a new generation of voters who demanded government take an active role in their lives and finances. And today, the same thing is happening. Just like before, the new blue wave of Democrats is making promises that will buy them voters loyalty for a generation. In California, for example, America's largest state by far, the Democratic Party has officially adopted the cause of a universal basic income into their political platform, a program that guarantees every citizen a fixed amount of income. Programs are already underway in cities like Stockton and Oakland in California, and the idea is quickly spreading. Chicago, Illinois is considering launching its own program, and now even more conservative states like Georgia, Mississippi, West Virginia, and North Dakota are beginning to seriously consider basic income for its citizens too. And while the intentions of guaranteeing every U.S. citizen a minimum income are good-natured, mark my words, these coming mandates will have catastrophic consequences. For example, where will all that money come from to pay for such a lavishly expensive scheme? Simple. The American worker. Universal basic income is a platform that once it goes nationwide, according to nonpartisan economists, could ultimately cost the American taxpayer as much as $3 trillion per year in new taxes. The scary part is, the left has even managed to convince those on the right that it can work, that it's a good idea. For example, the conservative economist Charles Murray has recently come out in favor of universal basic income, and even the right-wing think tank, the Adam Smith Institute, is now supporting the idea. And this is just the start. Because National Democrats have written a promise to enact a $15 per hour minimum wage into their platform too, regardless of where workers live or what they do, not only will policies such as these be an economic disaster, they'll be a social nightmare too. Pay people to do nothing, and they'll do nothing. It doesn't take a PhD to figure that out. This will only embolden the sense of greed and entitlement that now permeates our society, the kind of desperation that has led to college students at Middlebury putting a professor in a neck brace after she advocated letting a conservative speak, or the riots in Portland, Oregon that labelled the town America's most politically violent city. The same sense of entitlement will overtake our healthcare system too, Medicare for all, an idea for government-run healthcare so radical only Bernie Sanders used to support it in the Senate, now has the support of every 2020 Democratic candidate and 120 co-sponsors in Congress. Now, by Bernie Sanders' own admission, his plan would cost trillions. It will be more than America can afford. If you thought Obamacare was a disaster, you haven't seen anything yet. Already, the leading Democrats for the 2020 nomination for president are calling to forgive Puerto Rico's $70 billion debt. Do you think that's about good fiscal policy, or about the 300,000 Puerto Ricans, all eligible to vote upon registering, who have moved to the crucial swing state of Florida since last year? Meanwhile, Democrat Jared Polis of Colorado has introduced a bill to forgive student debt in a bid to cancel $1.5 trillion in student loan debts nationwide. Who will pay for it? You guessed it. Polis's proposal is based on tax hikes, raising taxes to the tune of $1.9 trillion. Now, politicians will tell you these proposals are about things like fairness or equality. But what they're really about, like everything in politics, is power. As the political scientist Harold Laswell observed, politics at its core is about who gets what, when, and how. Today is no different, and starting in this November's elections, the next generation of America's voters, the millennials, will be deciding who gets what, when, and how. And that brings me to the most important part of my research, what this new era of politics will mean for you. Unfortunately, I don't believe these changes coming to America can be stopped. Demographics are destiny. There's just too much power behind the blue wave as it just keeps getting stronger. Like a real-life tidal wave bearing down on a seaside town, there's no way of stopping it just getting out of its way. It's the only way to survive. In short, the next 20 years will present enormous dangers to your money and financial well-being as an increasingly socialistic Democrat party solidifies its hold on our politics. Remember, during the last major blue wave in America, the national debt soared, 
the dollar lost more than half its value and unemployment hit 25% in America. With FDR's Executive Order 6102, for example, he even made it illegal to own gold coins, gold bullion or gold certificates. Americans who failed to turn over their gold faced a 10-year jail term, plus a penalty of twice their investment's value, up to $10,000. Then, after he confiscated all the gold, FDR immediately raised its price, effectively cutting the purchasing power of the US dollar by nearly half. It's astounding, but it's true. The worse things got in FDR's America, the more emboldened his government became to trample on people's liberties and property rights even further. In short, we predict similar rights and freedoms will once again be tossed aside, only on a much bigger scale. So what can you do? You're going to have to pray, and you're going to have to trust God. And this has been one of the things that God has said. He is going to take care of his people in these times. And we really have to be walking close to him. We, we really have to be in the spirit to know what to do and not what, what not to do. When you think about a universal basic income and universal health care, it sounds good on the surface. It sounds like a compassionate thing to do. But when you work out the numbers and you work out who's going to pay for it and what it's being designed to do to keep people in a state of poverty, to keep people in a state where they're dependent upon the government to do everything for them, they are weaponizing an army of people to do whatever. If, and, and if you can see this as, as the perfect example of this is some of the Section 8 housing. And if you're in Section 8, please, I'm not talking about you. But the system is set up for you to stay in that system forever. Hey, you're down on your luck. Um, we have a home for you. You can come and come and live here at a, a reduced rate. But the idea was supposed to be for you to stay there for a small amount of time until you got yourself back on your feet. There are four in five generations of people living in Section 8 housing, and they don't even have a desire to get out. They're happy. They're happy being there. And this is the mindset of the people that we have that are growing up now because they're comfortable. Oh, the government gave me this. this isn't this wonderful? You know, we are becoming more and more like other foreign countries. Russia, for example. They did this. Okay, you're 15. Your job is going to be the garbage man. You're 15. Your job is going to be the doctor. It's, it's not based upon what you want to do. It's not based upon your skill set. You know, we have 30 people in this region here and 40 people in this region here. We're going to pack you up and ship you over here because we need five more people over here. You have no choice. You have no freedom. And this is what people right now, they don't, they don't think about it in these terms and they don't think about it in this, in this way, but this is what they're signing up for. Do you realize that they have so weaved the health care system into the law that President Trump is still unable to get it completely out. They are getting, they have teams of lawyers that are trying to un, un, undo it. But because Obama and all of those people that work with him, they were intent on destroying this country, they really wrapped the, the laws up. The insurance industry has been completely damaged by this. The doctors and the nurses have been completely damaged by this. No one wants to get in the healthcare industry. You know why there's not a lot of doctors anymore? They can't make any money. It's not wrong to make money, but if, if you're in a profession, if you go to school for 16 years and you get out and you, you're told, you have to take care of this person here, and they need an MRI, and we're going to pay you $2 to perform that MRI. doesn't matter that it costs you $3 million for the machine. The government has said MRIs are $2. So now, not only that, 
okay, everybody has to get, get an MRI. The doctor has the training, the knowledge, the nurses have the training and the knowledge. In order to treat you, in order to, to, to do what the government says they, do, they, they need to do in order to keep their funding, you have to get a whole bunch of dumb tests that you don't even need. This, this is what the, the healthcare system is designed to do. It is stealing money from one sector of the economy and giving it to the government. All of these things are, are, are going on right now, and it looks good, it looks compassionate, but if, if you're unaware, you will make the wrong decision and you will vote for these things. <clears throat> the reason that we showed you this is so that you can understand that the political realm and the political turmoil does affect your personal finances, and we hope that this will motivate you to be involved and participate. It is fascinating to me that Congress still has not completely abandoned Obamacare. What's even more crazy is that the systems that were put in place by Obama are so well done, it's taken teams of legal anal analysts to try to find a way to shut it down. But if our president is constantly being sidetracked by political fights within his own party, as well as outside his party, what is the hope and expectation for radicals? We're not watching what the other hand is doing over here. We'll keep you tied up right here, and we can do a whole bunch of stuff. And they're sliding the stuff in the back door because we're, we're fighting so hard over here to get the stuff. This should be simple. It, sh it, sh it should just go through with no problem. The level of the deception that the millennials is walking in is great. But it all boils down to the mindset of the people. If you raise up a set of people who expect the government to do everything for you, then you become their slave. We are all compassionate. We don't want to see people suffer and go without, but there are people in the government who will use that against us. And they will make promises that the government <laughs> will make everything better for you, but it's just an empty promise. Skip down to the prophetic word. This was given to Pastor Barber on June, January 2nd, 2017. Come up here with me today, for I want to share the secrets of the heavenly kingdom with you. And there is a secret that has a razor-sharp edge to it that will rock the nations. Donald Trump will go forth with great revelation knowledge from me, and he will suffice to do the works that I have called him forth to do. Many shall be astonished at this man of the hour, and they will have to admit that they were wrong about him. I chose this man at this given time to do a specific work for me in this nation, and even abroad. Give him a chance to start moving the mountains that were placed before America. For I truly am with this man, and I will be the one making the quality decisions that lay before him. Pray without ceasing and watch the mountains being moved from here to there. Prophetic word, May 17th, that I have received. <clears throat> the political turmoil in this country is only going to increase. The enemy is mad at my son Donald because he is not afraid to do my bidding. The enemy has laid many traps for him, but I will keep him from stepping into those traps. My children walk in so much deception. One minute they love me and know all things, and the next minute they hate me and can't see the truth for anything. Upheaval. This country is going through a great upheaval. I am setting the stage to perform one of the greatest revivals since the book of Acts. It shall far exceed man's wildest imaginations. No eye has seen nor ear heard of what I am about to do. The angels wait in great expectancy at what I am about to do. I will dominate the forces of darkness. My plan will be established firmly in this earth. In the last one. The political turmoil in this country is only going to increase. The enemy is mad at my son Donald. I think I put this in here twice. Bottom line, God is going to dominate the forces of darkness. And we have nothing to fear. But God, we have to be in awe of God. We have to be listening to his Holy Spirit. 
at all times and in all ways. I believe from what we have read about revivals in history that there are inventions, there are gifts that God is going to give the body of Christ that is going to cause us to prosper in this season. And it doesn't matter what is going on around about us. I often think about the um, the Colonel Sanders. Did not become born again until he was 65. When he became born again, he got the recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken. Died a millionaire because he served God. And if God can do that for him, he certainly can do that for us. So again, there's no reason to fear these things that are going on. There is a reason to understand them so that you can be wise as doves, I think the scripture is, and harmless as serpents. I might have it twisted around. But understand, there's a, there's a part that we have to play in this. And that part is praying and interceding, not only for ourselves, but our family and for this nation. Does everyone understand everything that was said tonight? Any questions on anything? Father, I just thank you for this teaching and this word, the PowerPoint that this man put together. I pray that all of the things that you want us to know spiritually would come to the very forefront of our hearts and our souls. I pray, Father God, that in the days ahead that we would remember the words that you want us to remember and that we would be proactive in our relationship with you. And Father, as we are seeking to understand the times and the seasons and in accordance with your will to be in the proper time and the proper season, we just yield ourselves to you this night. We thank you for giving us this revelation and we thank you for the fruit that is going to be produced by it. We give you all honor and all glory tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.